Happy Tuesday, everybody. This is the Longhorn Confidential for September 19th, 2023. I'm Danny Davis, the Austin American Statesman. As always, Kirk Bowles, he's here. Cedric Golden, he's here. Thomas Jones, he's here as well. Uh, we appreciate you watching us on YouTube or statesman.com or listening to us wherever you get your podcasts. Um, we're going to be talking a lot about Big 12 play today. But first, let's put a bow on uh, UT's final non non-conference game of the season. Uh, Texas 31, Wyoming 10 this past Saturday at DKR. Uh, game was tied 10-10 after the third quarter, but 21 unanswered points in the fourth quarter uh, led Texas to the win. Quinn Ewers, not his best performance, but still accounted for three uh, touchdowns, two passing, one rushing touchdown. Jaron Thompson had a pick six in the fourth quarter, kind of the exclamation point on a pretty decent defensive effort for the for the Longhorns. So before we actually talk about the football game, um, DKR kind of had some new bells and whistles uh, this weekend um, for a sold-out crowd, a pretty cool light show there in the second half. Um CDC doing a lot of things to make this, uh, you know, home field advantage kind of stick out. We talked to a couple of players on Monday. I know Thomas, you're writing about that at some point this week, and they were impressed. Maybe they're actually watching that light show maybe when they should have been actually in the defensive huddles. I don't think the coaches minded too much because they were pulling away at that point. But um, Thomas, we'll start with you since you're writing about it. What, what were your thoughts about just the atmosphere at DKR? We kind of didn't get to see all of it or hear all of it because the press box kind of obscured some of the views, but from what you saw online or from what you heard, what were your, what were your impressions? Yeah, it, it was awesome. I mean, the reaction from the crowd and the students was was great. I think it's what CDC and the UT folks wanted. And you know what was really good? The timing of it was really good because they held off on really, you know, the main event wasn't until the fourth quarter. That's when they really showed off all the new toys. And that kind of coincided with UT's 21 nothing run in that period. Um, coincidence? I don't know. But it was pretty cool. Kirk, you've seen a lot of home games uh, over over the years. What was your what was your impression of what you saw this week and saw and heard this weekend? It's all about entertainment. Show must go on. And and the other thing I like is that you know too often you know this has got to be such big business and and corporate. Uh, this is to be for the students and the players. You know, to me first and foremost. So I, I'm glad to see them kind of cater. Uh, to them and uh, like you said I wish we could have seen the whole thing it was kind of hard to embrace uh, where we were seated in the press box but uh, you know the Alabama you know kind of set the standard and and theirs is more enclosed so that was really cool and I think the I think the players love both of them and I like that Texas is you know trying to do something stay on the cutting edge yep said well you know the customer is always right and these people pay a lot of money to come That's to the football games. And so you got to give them a little bit more bang for their buck. And I think CDC kind of understands that they they are going to be uh, a great a great program this year. They're they're gonna they're I think they're gonna be in the Big 12 championship game. And he's got to keep them on that cutting edge. SCC is coming up. We got a glimpse of what Alabama brings to the table. And you, you got to know that some of those other schools are doing something similar. I, I didn't, I don't know that our angle in the press box was very good to be able to see the full thing. And, uh, but I'm going to go online and look, but from what I saw, I thought it was pretty cool. I mean, drones, everybody loves drones and um, everybody loves good music. And so I've got some musical selections that I'm going to probably uh, uh, suggest to CDC to, to get that thing popping a little bit more. I like the light show, but I think we can do better on that music. Hey, I don't man, know if the seventies and eighties music said. No offense. Sixties. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, hey. it's, it was. I thought it was cool to see because I think we got to put a little bit more perspective. And um, we we're talking a little bit about to Jalen Jalen Ford about this yesterday, but you know when not uh, or David Benda, I believe it was one of those two. But when they got to campus. A lot of these players, that was a 2020 season where it was a pandemic. The stands were a fourth full. There was some other stuff going on as well that that season. So there wasn't a lot of energy at times, um, you know, in the crowd. And so just to kind of see what's happened in the last four years in the stadium, just kind of it's a it's an event again. I mean, you know, people are excited to come. People are thrilled for 
not only the product on the field, but kind of the the bells and whistles and other stuff that's going on, going on, whether it's outside the stadium with Bebo Boulevard or inside the stadium now with this light show and drones and music and don't stop believing and flashlights and all the, all that stuff. So it's pretty cool just to see where this, where this, um, you know, where the stadium has come in the last four years and CDC, Drew Martin, that whole, that gang over there deserves a lot of credit for some of the stuff that they have, that they have done. But, um, I think more important this weekend was the, actually what happened on the field, and that was a win for Texas. We don't need to belabor the Wyoming game too much, but I do kind of want to know, after three games, um, three wins by Texas, two at home over Rice and Wyoming, and then at Alabama, what is one thing you liked about the Longhorns in non-conference play, and what is one thing that you may be concerned about as we head into uh, the Big 12 schedule? Um, Kirk, we'll start with you. I think it's obvious. This is a defense that uh... – Sark can rely on. I think you can trust them. They they bring it every game. You know, we saw it in the Wyoming game where uh, the running back transfer from Northern Illinois breaks one off on the fifth play of the game for a touchdown. The next 61 plays, Wyoming gets a field goal. So, you know, I, th- I don't think we give enough credit to Pete Kwiatkowski, the defensive coordinator who was really under fire, you know, that first year when they were blowing second half leads right and left. Uh, one of them to Baylor up in Waco. So uh, no, I, I just like it. It seemed like a very cohesive group uh, swarming to the ball, making uh, takeaways, you know, getting different, different interceptions from different people. Sid wrote about the pass rush and, you know, you got uh, what six different players with a sack and eight set sacks and three games. So I, I like how they're coming together and, you know, and they would have had a lot more trouble with Wyoming if that defense hadn't been uh, such a shutdown unit, you know, after that fifth play. So for, for me, it's a defense. It seemed like they're going to be uh, be there every Saturday. Thomas, what did you like? What are, what are you concerned about? Oh, um, you know, Sark touched on this in his press conference on Monday. The offensive versatility is, is, is impressive. Um, you saw against Alabama, Quinn had a, Heisman caliber performance and that really led UT to that win Uh, you saw against Wyoming Quinn wasn't great they handed the ball to Jonathan Brooks and the running game kind of took over and even in their passing game Xavier Worthy's kind of a mainstay Uh, Donna Mitchell's come over from Georgia he's a big play guy and JT Sanders had a 100 yard game against Alabama at tight end so offensively they can score points in a lot of ways now the concern is quarterback's the most important player on the team we all know that is that consistency there every week that you know what you're going to get from Quinn um again he didn't have a great game against Wyoming and they could afford to still beat Wyoming but can they not get a great game from Quinn and beat a higher quality opponent and I'm being nice to Wyoming so I was very impressed by him said uh, I, I really love the defense. Um, this is this is a playmaking defense, and they, they were able to they're able to get sacks, they're able to get takeaways. The quarterbacks playing great. Uh, John A. Barron, if he's not careful, he's going to get some All American votes. I mean, I mean, he is a a bully tackler. He is a playmaking uh, interceptor of the ball, and and he's a film buff. And when you put those three together. And every time we ask him a question, oh, it's film, it's film. He's preparing for this. He wants to be great. He's got Michael Huff mentoring him. That's a Thorpe Award winner. So when you have those kind of uh, weapons on on defense, Derek Johnson mentoring linebackers, um, you're, you're going to be in games. But the question is, can you get off to a good start? They haven't played, besides JT Daniels, a journeyman. They haven't played a, a – a quarterback that that's honed into a system that's been around for for a couple of um, years in one system. Uh, Blake Shapin's probably not going to play this weekend, so they get uh, Sawyer Roberts, who's new. And so, but after that, you're going to get Jalen Daniels, you're going to get Tyler Shuck, you're going to get Dylan Gabriel, guys who are in those programs. So that worries me the most: the slow starts. The slow starts, and when they run into a, if they run into a beehive, will Quinn be able to extricate themselves? 
out of, out of a deficit, um, having had a slow start. The four quarters are promising, but you can't, like Sark said on um, on Monday, you can't live on that. You can't rely on that. So, like Thomas said, uh, they're going to have to get some more consistency uh, from that quarterbacking position, and maybe that'll solve these slow starts. I'll echo what Seth said for the thing I'm concerned about is just the slow starts. Um, the Big 12 is better than Rice and Wyoming, although I think those are non-conference opponents that are on the rise and are both 2-1 and one this season. And having having good season, both could very well end up in a bowl and none of us would be surprised. But uh, Texas can't play like that in, in Big 12 play and expect to, expect to get it done. So um, it's kind of weird because I think that's kind of the – inverse of the problem they had last year was bad fourth quarters but strong starts and um they need to figure figure that out at least uh how they how they get out of the gates and uh Quinn hasn't been um overly spectacular in a a couple of his games I mean he's gotten the job done obviously the Alabama game was a as uh Thomas put it a Heisman trophy resume game but the one thing he has done consistently throughout the um, season is taking care of the ball I think there's six uh, FBS quarterbacks uh, who have not thrown a pick yet, but have thrown over 80 passes, and he's one of them. Um, Texas State also has another one of those one of those quarterbacks. Um, so that's really impressive. Um, we all saw that at Oklahoma State game last year, and have seen what happens when uh, Quinn's a little careless with with the football, and that's not what Texas needs. So he's done a very good job of uh, taking out the care of the football. He kind of gave a uh, us a little grief yesterday because someone asked him about it um, during during his little media availability, and uh, he was kind of knocking on wood, saying that we, we're we're not talking about that streak because he's actually going back going back to last season, um, two hundred and five straight passes without an, without a pick, which is the second longest streak in school history behind the three hundred and eight straight that Sam had back in two thousand eighteen. So, uh, kind of a historic run for Quinn without interceptions. He needs to keep that going, obviously through Big Twelve play. Don't know if he's going to go through all nine games up during an interception, but he definitely needs to limit the turnovers as well as the rest of his teams. There was a fumble by Jaden Blue late in that Wyoming game, which I'm sure he's uh, Jaden's had to t- look a couple times on film. But uh, I, I, I've liked the way Texas has limited the turnovers in uh, non-conference play. But moving on, uh, Baylor on Saturday night, 6.30 at McLean Stadium. They'll be on ABC. This is Texas's Big 12 opener. Uh, Texas is 3-0, first time since 2012, ranked number three in the AP poll. Baylor's 1-2. They lost to Texas State, which was kind of surprising in their season opener. But also, um, Utah's the number 11 team in that aforementioned AP poll, and Baylor led them late until a late collapse, and um, Utah was able to secure that win. Uh, Baylor finally beat Long Island last week to kind of end their losing streak. So that's kind of the nuts and bolts going into this game. Um Baylor is only a couple years removed from uh, winning a winning a conference championship and kind of being the toast of the Big 12. weren't great last year. We're expected to be a middle of the road Big 12 team this year. So let's kind of keep this question open. Kirk, we'll start with you. Is there a Baylor Bear? Texas fans need to know. Is this a statement game for Baylor? What exactly should Texas fans be expecting out of this Baylor program, this Baylor team going into this weekend? Well, Baylor very quietly has been one of the best programs in the Big 12. Uh, The last 10 years, they've got 97 wins. You know, only A&M and TCU have more in the state of Texas with 98. And Texas is somewhere around 86, 87. So, but, and Dave Aranda, Dave Aranda gave him a really jolt in the arm when he came over from LSU. Tremendous defensive mind. Like you said, Danny, put it together 12 and 2. Wins the Big 12, you know, wins the Sugar Bowl over Ole Miss. But lately it's trending poorly. I mean, they were, what were they, six and seven last year? I think they're seven and nine, their last 16 games. And, you know, part of it, it just shows you how valuable the quarterback is. You know, Dave, you were just talking about Quinn Ewers and, and TJ. Like, you know, a little bit as Quinn Ewers goes, Texas is going to go because they have to rely on their passing game so much more because the running game is – it's kind of sputtered and uh, done well at times with Jonathan Brooks. So this, this is probably a statement game for Bader. Again, it's the last time they'll probably host Texas for a long time, if ever. And, uh, you know, Bader lost four offensive line starters, and that is hard to to make up for and redo. And Sawyer Robertson 
transfer from Mississippi State. Very athletic, but I think his completion percentage is like 45%. So, but like you said, Dunny, the Utah game kind of shows you they can they can rise up and bite you. I mean, last year when Texas beat them, remember they ran the ball the last 22 times of the game, but, you know, Bayer led 9 nothing in 27-24 in that game. So, I don't know, Seth, what do you think? I mean, it's do you know what you're going to get from Baylor? Yeah, energy. This could make their season. Before the Long Island game, I believe they lost six straight games dating back to last season. They've been on a steady decline, and so they need they need they need this. They need this for their fan base. They need they need this for Aranda, you know, because that Bloom's coming off that rose. He's supposed to be a defensive guru. Uh, coached a really good game against Utah, and there was a pass interference call that wasn't called at the end of that game. And uh, I know refs don't like to call it there at the end, but if that, that plays in the first quarter, it's, it's a PI. It is. And so um, they know that they can really ruin Texas's CFP chances. There's not, there, there's no way to explain away a Baylor loss if you're trying to get one of those top four. So they got, they got to go in there and they got to be Baylor uh, convincingly. I don't – there's not a bear on the team that scares me. You can't get it wrong at quarterback in this conference. Too many good quarterbacks in this conference. And and Baylor does not have a good quarterback on its team. And so I think this Longhorn uh, defense is going to stack the – they're going to stack the box. They're going to they're gonna make Sawyer Robertson try and beat him with his arm, which I just don't think he can. And uh, if they play mistake-free ball, I think it's going to be a relatively easy afternoon at Baylor. Never easy to go in there and win. Uh, don't know that they're going to work them, but I do. But I do think they're going to take care of business. This is this is a game that, that Texas should just go in there and win. They're more talented. Uh, they play smart now, and and they have big, big, much bigger fish to fry than the Baylor Bears. So I don't think that this is going to be a trap game. I think they're going to go in there and take care of business. You do? I, I mean, generally, I, I do agree with said. I think Texas should win comfortably because Baylor's quarterback play isn't great. But this isn't DKR. They're not going to have a light show to give them juice in the fourth quarter. They're not going to have the drones going around and the smoke and the students. If they mess around and it's a tight game in the fourth, UT could have issues. Because Baylor can beat you. Baylor does a couple of things well that UT might have difficulty with. They got a tight end named Drake Dabney. He has 139 yards and three touchdowns on eight catches. UT hasn't faced a tight end that makes plays downfield yet. And Baylor also has this kid in the middle of their defense, a linebacker named Matt Jones, 6'3", 250, kind of that old school, 50 year senior type. He leads the team in tackles. He could cause problems for that UT running game. And if that running game bogs down a bit, they're going to need Quinn Ewers to play better than he did against Wyoming. I'll just say really quick, um, keep an eye on Richard Reese, the sophomore running back for Baylor. Only He was the only Bear that was on the All-Big 12 preseason team. So far, he's scored two of their five rushing touchdowns. So he kind of seems to be the the star of their offense, if there is a star on that offense. And if they do have Sawyer, a backup quarterback, uh, leading the charge. They're going to need something out of that running game. And, and um, Richard Reese is definitely where that starts. Um, really quickly said, you wrote about this in your nuggets that ran in Tuesday's paper, but Texas has kind of managed to split the sacks um, kind of evenly among their, uh, among their defensive line. Uh, Kirk mentioned it earlier, but eight sacks split among six players um, really quick. Everyone just pick up, pick a player. Who's going to lead the team in uh, sacks on Saturday, who's going to get to Sawyer Robertson the most? Uh, Sad, we'll start with you since it was in your nuggets today. You know, Baron Sorrell showed up and got one, but uh, Anthony Hill was a was kind of quiet in this last game. So I think I think they may turn him loose again and um, get him on the edge. And I see him being a, a defensive end in the future. I think I think it's hard to block him. So I'm going to go with the kid, Anthony Hill. Kirk, who's your pick? I like Sorrell. I think he finally had his coming out uh, game against Wyoming and he joined the party. So I think maybe he's feeling a little bit. So I think he rides the momentum from the Wyoming game and brings the heat. TJ? 
I, I'm with Doug. I, I think Sorrell's on the verge of having a few breakout games. Before the season began, he said, look, my goal is double-digit sacks. He only has one so far, came against Wyoming. I think he reaches double-digit sacks this year, and I think it starts in Baylor. And give me uh, give me Byron Murphy up the middle. I we we see him we see him what he does in the, in the end zone as far as with his hands. Do it all. Let's see, uh, let's, let's see what he actually does on defense where he's he's actually going to make his money uh, going forward. So give me give me Byron. Uh, we'll be talking to him after the game about actually his defensive uh, prowess as opposed to his uh, pass catching abilities, which was pretty fun to to see in that Wyoming game. But um, McLean Stadium on a Saturday night. It's going to be packed. I don't think they've announced a sellout yet, but we know that announcement's coming at some point. Uh, this is probably going to be the preview of what Texas should expect in the Big 12 this season. This is their first of four true row games, not including uh, the Cotton Bowl. They had to go to TCU. They had to go to Houston. They have to go to Iowa State in November, which you know may be interesting depending on how that Cyclone program is uh, is faring at that point. But you know, there's a lot of talk on Monday when we talked to Steve and talked to the players about embracing the hate and horns down and what they should expect um, on the road since this is their last go around in the big 12. Um, I guess it's kind of open-ended and we'll start with Kirk since he's kind of the, he's seen a lot of horns down in his day. Um, what should Texas expect on the road? Is this just going to be a complete insane hate, hate fest on the road or um, what should they expect? And how do you think that Longhorns are going to handle that adversity in those environments? Lots of vitriol. That's what we can expect. Uh, every stop on this Embrace the Hate tour, which I, I applaud Sark for just taking it head on. He's addressing the elephant in the room, and they're going to get horns down in spades from the pregame warm up. Uh, and I think how you know how they handle that first quarter, that emotional surge that that Baylor and every you know home own Big 12 team that host Texas is going to feel and can they weather that storm like I said they haven't been a great uh, first half team I, I looked it up and they've got like uh, three touchdowns in their first 21 uh, possessions uh, one in each game so Texas has to start a lot quicker otherwise you're just going to energize that beta crowd and ignite it because their student body is very engaged so uh going to be uh, uh, off the charts hate, and this is stop number one. They're mean in Waco. They, they are, can be. They can be mean. They can be mean. I saw I saw a guy at a basketball game. Kevin Durant was there to to see the Longhorns play, and I see I saw a Baylor fan reach his hand out, and Durant reached his hand out, and the guy went like that. Nice. <laughs> you little punk. That's Kevin Durant. You don't do that to KD. I Junior mean, house. yeah, and so um, – these teams that Texas is playing on, on the road, this is their last chance to stick it to the big dog. So they're going to pull out all stops to try and beat Texas, try to ruin what Texas has built. Because Texas, Texas, uh, Texas and Oklahoma and K-State, those three teams really feel like they can they can go to special places. I mean, K-State's harder now that they've got a loss. But I think that um, you're going to get a lot of horns down, you're going to get a lot of vitriol. You're gonna you're gonna get some some really mean mean fans. Baylor uh, knows that this can make their season and look for trick plays. Aranda's a conservative play caller, but he'll go for trick plays. And he went for it on fourth down six times, six times this past week. So he they go for it on fourth. And and if he's inside of the on the plus side of the fifty, they're gonna go because they don't know when they're gonna get back there. So. Uh, look for him to be to be much more aggressive with his play calling. Look look for it to be a an angry house at Baylor, and um, you know Texas has got to get through the first half and make sure everything is still in place. And they've already shown that they can win a game on the road late. So uh, we'll be really entertaining at least for three quarters. I I think the uh, based on what happened in Alabama. I think all that hate helps this Texas team focus. I, I think the I think Longhorns will come out strong. I think they'll come out fast. I think they'll be very one single minded on having a fast start. And I think uh, by the end of the third quarter, those Baptists will be looking for ice cream and milk or whatever they do after the game. 
I think it's Texas wins conference. I'm, I'm Baptist. They do a lot more than that, Tom. <laughs> I'm a, I dated a girl at Baylor. They do a lot more than that. <laughs> well, whatever they're going to do, I think they're doing it by the fourth quarter. I think Texas rolls. I think aside from a few overserved um, idiots in Alabama, I think this is probably going to be a different um, kind of hate that Texas has to um, endure a Big 12 play because this is personal um, within the conference. I do think it probably helps that they don't have to go to Stillwater. I think Oklahoma State has a really good home crowd. They don't have to go to Tex. They don't have to worry about anyone assaulting them on the field after the game, as we saw last year. But, you know, for the Houston, for the TCU, for the Baylors, this is in-state. This is really personal. Um, I expect those crowds to be absolutely insane. Iowa State, we'll see um, where the Cyclones are in November. That may be a little bit more tamed down than it would be if this was this weekend um, or before they lost to Ohio, as they did last week, which is still, I'm trying to get my mind around that. But I expect uh, it's going to be pretty, pretty intense throughout the season. And I think Texas knows that. Um, you know, we hear enough that, you know, this is Texas, everyone, we get everyone's best shot, blah, blah, blah. So I think they're expecting it, but it may be ramped up just a little bit this season with all the big 12 drama going on, especially with those in-state, in-state schools in Houston, they're, they're going to want to show out, you know, they've been waiting to get in this big 12 for a while and Texas is uh, leaving. And I'm sure they're very happy that they got Texas as a home game this year, as opposed to a road game. So I expect the Cougars to show out it, even though that program is kind of nose diving and not going the right direction, but the fans will be there. Um, the fans will show up even if the team does not. Uh, really quickly, since we're running out of time, since this is Big 12 play, um, call your shot. Who's making it to the Big 12 championship game? I want Texas OU personally just for the drama and just having yeah. Brett Yormark have to eat his words regardless, but I'm actually going to go um, OU, I'm going to go Texas U UCF, um, assuming that they can get their quarterback healthy. I think UCF is a nice, nice little dark horse that doesn't have to play Texas during the regular season. So that helps. And maybe they can sneak into that uh, championship picture. Kirk, uh, who's, who's your pick? Yeah. You know, you left out going to West Virginia where Texas had problems too. And you're right. The schedule works out pretty well for them because to me, they're two, probably the three biggest stumbling blocks are probably K state, Kansas, both, of those here at home and then Oklahoma at that neutral side Dallas so I, I watched K-State last week against Missouri they lost on a 61 yard walk off field goal and K-State's for real they are a solid team Will Howard terrific he was hobbling a little bit but I'm going to stick with Texas Kansas State because I think those are still the two best teams that uh, I've seen out of the Big 12 so far I like um I like what Daniel said with Texas OU and that's the the romanticist in me wants that one but I agree with the duck I'm sticking with Texas and K State K State I watched that game and uh that that is a that is a really really good all around sound football team that doesn't beat itself they're not flashy but they have a they have a plan and they have a really good coach who knows what he's doing and so. I'm sticking with that one, but I, I would really hope for, uh, you know, the columnist in me would love to see Texas OU throw up the deuces as they leave the Big 12 with one of them wearing, wearing the belt. But um, I'm going Texas K-State. I, I think Danny makes a good point that UCF avoids Texas, and so they may avoid a loss that other teams don't. Uh, but I like Kansas this year. I think Kansas has the best offense in the conference. Uh, I think they lose in Austin, Texas. But I think they can beat anyone else throwing a couple of shootouts. I think Kansas, in a surprise, meets Texas in a rematch in the Big 12 title game. All right, so we got four Texas votes. we got two Kansas State votes, one Kansas and one UCF. So we'll have to see how that plays out over the next uh, nine, ten weeks and see who's in Arlington in December. Um, really quick, let's go around the 40 acres. Texas is not the only show in town. There's a volleyball team that's ranked num number nine nationally in the ABCA poll. They also open up Big 12 play this week. And if you really want that Texas OU matchup, that's where they're going. The, the volleyball team's <laughs> heading up to Oklahoma. A little different with the with the conference schedule this week. They're going um, games back-to-back. -back. They're playing. They're just kind of getting that conference. Uh, a lot of conference games over the weekend. So they'll play Oklahoma on Friday and then again on Saturday. Uh, Texas has won 11 in the last 12 uh, Big 12 titles, at least a share of the Big 12 title. I, they're a favorite to win it this year. I don't think anyone's voting against them, but uh, they get on that road to a, a conference championship chase this weekend in Norman. And then there's a soccer team ranked number 16th 
nationally. And we're going to find out a lot about Ange Kelly's team over the next week or so. On uh, Thursday night, they host Texas Tech. Texas Tech is 7 0 and, 0 and 2. And then on Monday, number one BYU comes to town. So BYU, the preseason favorite in this conference, obviously ranked number one nationally. Um, well, that's kind of that's kind of the big show. And if Texas can get out of this weekend with two wins, maybe a win and a tie, we'll know a lot about this team and kind of what they we should expect from them down the road. But that's kind of teasing what's going on on campus. Let's tease the on second thought podcast. Uh, Kirk said, "What are you guys working on? What's uh, what should we expect on Thursday when the, when the new pod drops?" Well, we're previewing Baylor. We're, we've got our old friend Bryce Cherry from the Waco Tribune Herald, a a really good friend, a, a, an excellent sports columnist. He's going to join us and um, give us all things Baylor, and then um, and we're going to get to the festivities. Yeah, we're we're expecting uh be good to see Bryce when we go up there. The Waco media is always nice to us whenever we roll into town. Our our friend uh, Zach Smith is now on the beat up there for the sure. for the Waco trip, so that'll be good to see him him up there. And it should be should be fun in the McLean Stadium press box on Saturday. But that's gonna do it for us. As always, we appreciate you watching us on YouTube and uh, on the Statesman website, listening to us wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, check out statesman.com throughout the week for all of our Baylor preview coverage. Uh, check out the website on Saturday night for our in-game coverage. And then after the game, um, obviously, we will have all of our post-game coverage as well. But uh, thanks for reading. Thanks for watching. We will see you all down the road. we we'll be back next Tuesday. And, yeah, check out the On Second Thought podcast on Thursday. But, yeah, for Danny, this is Kirk, Cedric, Thomas, deuces. <laughs>